Okay. Well, thank you everyone for coming out to this rally plan update. There's a lot of familiar names in the participants list, which is excellent to see. Uh, thank you to everyone who's been involved in this project so far, the uh, Sakai Accessibility Working Group, people like uh, Neil, who's invaluable, um, uh, Gonzalo from U of Michigan, uh, Matt Jones from uh, Longsight, and others that have been involved in that group for a while. I'm, uh, I think there's a lot of familiarity generally that Sakai has an accessibility uh, project underway, but I'm going to take some time to introduce everyone to what that is taking the form of. So if my slides successfully advance. Uh, here's, here's the agenda for today. I wanted to uh, get a brief introduction from those who are here. So if you uh, want to grab the mic and uh, mention who you are, what institution you, you are coming uh, to represent or not, and a uh, summary of why accessibility interests you or your institution, that'd be great. If you'd like to type that into the chat room, I'd be happy to summarize some of them as they go by. Whichever is your preference, um, uh, I'll yield the mic in a moment, and if you want to get typing, you're welcome to get typing. I think it's nice to know that there's a community. I think everyone uh, assumed there was, but it's nice to see uh, what brings people to the issue of accessibility, especially in Sakai. So I really appreciate that brief little bit of insight. Uh, I'll, I hear words. Oh, um, yeah, I just turned my mic on. This is Marilyn from Ithaca College. Excellent. Uh, give me a sense of uh, what, what brings you to uh, this update today, Marilyn. Well, I, I, I posted on uh, the list a couple months ago because it was we have a blind student here at Ithaca College and our disability office is printing everything from Sakai because he said the accessibility was so horrible. And I had posted that and I tried to get him to come in to get more specific. We're, we're running a 293 now and we're upgrading to 10 in August. So it might, maybe that solves some of it. But he was just like, it's unusable. And there were a couple reasons. Um, really, really long um, file names and JPEGs. But in any case, he said it was unusable. But I didn't actually get more information. So I'm, I'm curious to see what the community's doing and how Sakai is evolving to maybe make it more um, uh, tolerable for the blind students. All right. Um, I'll talk about some of those issues, and uh, I'm, I'm glad that you've got an authentic kind of uh, experience to, to, that's uh, driving you on here. I see uh, Adam introducing himself from Oxford and the importance of accessibility to them, uh, Trisha from UVA, uh, Louisa from Marist, uh, Janelle from Tufts, Michelle Irvine from uh, University of Virginia again, Tiffany Stahl from University of Virginia, um, and Christine from Rutgers, uh, Terry from Kentucky Christian University. That's a new one for me to, to see. Um, interesting news update. Uh, Fawe, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right because I see it so much in Sakai Dev mailing list, which is great to see. Uh, Tajin from uh, from uh, Gordon Cornwall, Steve Bernhold from Oxford, and uh, a number of you mentioned they've got an official office for accessibility accommodations. And um, you know, I think generally, and myself included, where does Sakai, which I have some kind of responsibility for, and that office relate to all this is something that a lot of institutions and people in the the uh, position I assume you're most of you or many of you're in. Uh, are trying to reconcile. It's Wilma from Longsight. I get, wants to get a sense of accessibility in Sakai. Uh, sort of, I haven't had a chance to read everyone's uh, chat messages there, but I appreciate everyone making a comment. Anyone else want to grab the mic? Okay. Um, another plans is, uh, and please anyone stop me when I need to be interrupted, but I want to go through our plan as we've conceived it so far and uh, update that we're you know, not uh, 
well into the plan, but we still made some progress, some important progress that the community needs to hear about. Um, talk about the two scope of works we have and if they're useful or not. Uh, the challenge we have of trying to figure out what needs to be uh, addressed in Sakai and um, then further once once we know that how much work that could be and that's uh, an if followed by an if. Uh, we want to check in to see where institutions are as far as committing resources. We've had some expressions so far and um, I don't want to speak for anyone, but I can uh, share some generalities. And if anyone wants to speak of that moment too, they're more than welcome to. And then uh, important to give an explanation of ways to move forwards. And uh, I'd love to wrap up with the discussion as well. So without further ado, uh, I think everyone's familiar with the uh, short form of accessibility down to A11Y for dropping 11 letters of the middle of accessibility. It makes a nice hashtag and a, uh, a handy little simplification of a long English word. And it lets you pronounce things uh, uh, as alley with the ones in there representing uh, two L's. So keeping that in mind, we came up with the rally plan for Sakai to review accessibility and um, a community needs a good rally point. Uh, that's the the, and all the Sakai projects lately have catchy names, so we need to make sure we have that as well. So that's the the history behind the rally plan title. Don't think too much about that process. My little visualizations of how that work kind of <laughs> suggests it may not survive too much scrutiny, but I think it's a catchy name. The plan itself is a three-stage plan. The first two stages are ones that different parts of Sakai, tools, areas, responsibilities, features may move in and out of. And the third phase is a comprehensive review of Sakai and a way to for the Sakai community to assert its accessibility. So that first phase is um, generate and prioritize a comprehensive uh, uh, assessment of the unaudited areas of Sakai and identify potential uh, contributors to this whole plan. We have a really nice legacy of accessibility in Sakai, more on that in a second, and we have a growing area of portions of Sakai where the accessibility is kind of an unknown. We're certain the best intentions are going into it, but we're unclear about the current status. Uh, we do have some legacy audits of old versions that places like Indiana contributed. We have two uh, audits, that were partial audits, pardon me, that were commissioned of Sakai 2.9 that uh, Brock University, institution I'm representing, and Longsight have contributed to the community. Those were great resources, welcoming. Uh, those are great resources to have. It's also just as great to have all our room one people sliding in. Great to see you. Um, uh, on the uh, in room two, I know we had a last minute room change, so it's uh, great to have everyone sliding in there. If you haven't had a chance to uh, see our agenda for the day, it was shared in advance. And if you scroll up in the chat room, which I'm hoping big blue button will let you do, uh, there's links to the Google presentation as, as a presentation or text that could be handy. And, and if you were waiting around for me in uh, room one, all you've missed are introductions, and I'll give you a chance to update us as well. So uh, just a momentary welcome uh, to the room one folk, and thank you for your perseverance. <laughs> Related, uh, we're still uh, persevering in the area of accessibility in Sakai. We, we have our current resources of some partial audits. We've used that to get the insight that they have, and uh, create some JIRAs, um, work issues for the Sakai project. We have had success in getting those issues resolved for Sakai 10 and 11, but nonetheless there are other areas that still need attention uh, as far as remediation work. And two partial audits do not equal a full audit, and that's our overall concern with identifying the accessibility issues in Sakai. Once issues are identified, they can be uh, 
confirmed as uh, exactly as intended and accessible, or remediation work can begin to ensure that that identified area can uh, be made better. And that kind of work, unfortunately, can be large or small. More on that in a bit. So once we've got, we identified all of our issues, solved all of our issues, as best we can tell as a community, step after that is our phase three, which is a VPAT and a WCAG2 uh, audit and uh, certification assertion. So uh, I'll explain those terms in the coming slide, but the idea being in phase three, we do a VPAT, which is a voluntary product assessment template, I believe, which is a sort of self-study around the accessibility of your uh, product. And if we can go through a self-study process, we've got a low but nonetheless important uh, standard met for accessibility of Sakai, and we have some confidence that it's worth spending the money to have a tier one uh, organization uh, like the National Federation for the Blind in the US or an equivalent to do a review and assert the uh, higher standard WCAG2 or WCAG is another way people shorten that, uh, accessibility of Sakai. So I'm going to, there's a lot of terminology in there, a lot of jargon, so I want to get a chance to explain that, and I will, but the important thing is step one, take the audits and resources we have existing and also do larger um, uh, audit work on Sakai, identify our issues. Step two, fix those issues. And one and two could go back and forth. Step three, get do a VPAT to do a self-study of our accessibility and then shoot for having a third party uh, certify our, our WCAG2 level accessibility. I, do, I don't want to lose track though, as I mentioned these issues, that Sakai does do a pretty good job of accessibility. Um, we have a good legacy. We've had a lot of important work done by University of Indiana Adaptive Technology and Accessibility Center. They were a great resource that's a part of our community that's kind of stepped away. And that's okay, it's part of having a community. People uh, come, as my screen uh, moves around on you, so, uh, people will come and go, and that's part of the natural process. Um, but at the moment, we don't have what was a great resource involved in our community. Um, but we still have that legacy. We, our future directions uh, for Sakai also look good. Things like um, good help information in Sakai is currently available for Sakai 10. Uh, about creating accessible content, more just providing accessible tool. We're trying to give guidance to instructors and students about creating accessible content. And innovations like the, the Morpheus project have show a lot of promise. Removing iframes is uh, almost always a positive step as far as accessibility, and responsive design is a major enhancement as well. Uh, I think people who have a little bit of experience with persons with disabilities may have observed that a lot of those individuals prefer some mobile devices. If you think about alternative interfaces, uh, a lot of that was about zooming and uh, high contrast. If you can think of that same individual using something like an iPad, zooming is so immediate and easy, high contrast is a quick setting. There's a lot of reasons why individuals using alternative interfaces for Sakai may want to use a mobile device and Sakai 11 and the Morpheus project are really uh, uh, making that possible for everyone. So I mentioned WCAG2. WCAG2 is the World Wide Web Consortium's Web Content Accessibility Guide version 2. I always call it WCAG2 because I think it's a little more uh, comprehensible that it's an acronym. But a lot of people call it WCAG, which uh, makes sense, just the acronym spelled out. It's probably how a lot of screen readers, older screen readers read it. Um, so the WCAG 2 is a global standard by W3C, which brought you such things as HTML. And um, it's, I may include myself, considered to be a higher standard than the Americans with Disabilities Act Section 508, which is 
a useful standard that it's very um, easy to automatically test for, but significantly, WCAG2 has things like talking about making sure meaning is clear. Meaning is a tough thing for a computer to test for, but perhaps the most important thing we're talking about human beings trying to access our software. The other important thing about WCAG is it's a globalized standard. Um, speaking to me from Ontario, Canada, where our Accessibility for Ontarians Disabilities Act actually cites standards from the WCAG as law which is ideal for us in that we've got a legal regime we need to operate on, but we don't have to worry about things like our LMS or other tools uh, conforming to an Ontario standard. We need to make sure that they conform to a global standard. It just happens to be the rule of law for us. That's the case in Ontario, Quebec, and Canada, uh, and by implication in other provinces, Australia, the UK, uh, and other inst of institutions have adopted WCAG2 in a, a legal situation. The other interesting development in accessibility, and uh, maybe I'm sure has tracked this, is the situation with edX, Harvard MIT's uh, MOOC project. Their settlement uh, with a lawsuit brought by, I'm skimming my notes and not spying it, that, that was nonetheless um, adopted by the Department of Justice. The settlement, which is not exactly case law, but nonetheless the settlement they came to, uh, did suggest that all the edX websites needed to meet WCAG2 and relayed that back to the uh, ADA. And uh, Title II of the ADA prohibits discrimination on the basis of disability by state and local government entities. And it was interpreted that um, standards in the ADA itself uh, addressed or not addressed, WCAG2 level AA was a standard that edX needed to meet. So that's, uh, I think, an important development in uh, web accessibility around teaching and learning. And just uh, confirming that the WCAG2 is the way, uh, is a measure that we should be considering. Related, uh, Miami University, a uh, Sakai University at the time also had a lawsuit started against them from uh, the NFB, and that has proceeded to, uh, I believe, settled out of court. Nonetheless, DOJ got involved, and they are also being asked to meet WCAG2. <laughs> so another consideration for Sakai from a Comparative product perspective is uh, that VPAT versus WCAG2. Um, VPAT, important for the, uh, uh, the as a template that one can fill out about your own product. Um, the other nice thing about that is you can fill it yourself. The comparative LMS situation is most of the LMSs that we would compare ourselves to in the Sky community, things like a Desire to Learn's Brightspace or Blackbird, Black, Blackboard, um, would also provide a, a WCAG certification by a third party. Canvas has a VPAT. Uh, Atutor is just an interesting one to compare to because they actually do accessibility audits. Uh, Adam Marshall's got a good question about Moodle. I haven't found a uh, uh, we meet the standard uh, on the Moodle.org site. I did a little exploring through Moodle Rooms and Moodle Rooms relationship to Blackboard. Uh, I, I stopped at that <laughs> uh, tricky investigation. But if anyone does know what the formal uh, accessibility situation is with Moodle, uh, I would love to know and I'm sure if you can cut and paste the URL into the chat, uh, people would love to see as well. Um, little question aside, um, my concern is that as you look at these uh, list of other LMSs, and especially in things like the selection process for institutions considering their future LMS, knowing to, uh, well, let's say definitively, 
the accessibility standard of these LMSs is important. I know at our university and in many others, accessibility standards are included in procurement practices. And for a competitive sake, Sakai needs to be able to respond to those kinds of uh, RFPs and other things to suggest it's accessible. And from a teaching and learning perspective, we want an accessible, thank you for that link to uh, Moodle's uh, accessibility URL in the chat. From a teaching and learning perspective, we want to know that we're giving teachers and learners something that they can use regardless of their uh, individual capabilities. So I wanted to pause there and ask if there's anything I can clarify, explain, um, or revisit, either you can welcome to grab the mic if that's possible or type something into the chat. All right. Um, I just want to give someone a chance if they're banging away on their keyboard to hit return. Okay. Well, um, that's as I see it, the state of Sakai, state of uh, state of the uh, competitive situation. We've been working through this re this rally plan as an accessibility working group for a bit now. And we've had a lot of interest from some key stakeholders. And we've also taken the time to go and figure out what work like this might cost. And it's a difficult thing to assess. Uh, early in the process, it was really hard to get uh, budgetary numbers from commercial entities um, for a number of reasons. And um, one measure we got that's actually proven mostly useful is it costs around $100 a page to audit something. The irony being that a very simple uh, post to this page and the new page happens from that response kind of layout, our classic circa 2000 web page um, would cost for that one page makes uh, is the first interactive, the second page is the product that interaction be $200, that's uh, two pages. That same page, heavily Ajaxified, modernized, bootstrapped, et cetera, would be $100. It was one page, and that all happened dynamically. But I think most people intuitively know that single page, Ajax, bootstrapped, et cetera, et cetera, page is much more complex to review. So our investigation, our budgetary numbers are a little dubious for that reason. But nonetheless, we need to start from somewhere. Uh, we do have. Two scope of works from uh, SSB BART Group, who did Blackboard Review, and WebAIM, who's doing uh, the review for OAE, our, uh, our partner uh, project in the Perio. The uh, scope, the difference between those two. Uh, uh, scopes of work is quite large, um, but uh, one that in a second. Contacted the NFB. They did not respond to my emails, but the um, but they've since updated their website and they now list a bunch of partners that could do audits as well. So I I, I can't speak for them, but my perception is. The NFB may be trying to focus on their, I, let's call it core concerns, um, and referring others to uh, these commercial review services. Um, but nonetheless, they didn't respond to my emails, and now they do have a comprehensive list. I did uh, contact three other groups that haven't responded yet. Uh, one sort of did, but there, uh, there's a dec decline and some non-responses. But this is, we haven't begun any work, we're not commissioning anything, and I do want to highlight that if someone listening to me speak right now is familiar with uh, 
NC does accessibility reviews and is someone they want to vouch for or at least familiar with Sakai, I'd be interested to know. So the, the outcome of that consultation was SSB offered a scope of work around $60,000 just for an audit of Sakai. I'm pausing for people to identify audio issues. Okay. See, I mute everyone. Uh, SSB BART is a uh, commercial um, accessibility group. They did the, uh, they, I think they continue the Blackboard's review process. I don't know exactly what their uh, acronym is, but there you are. They suggested around 32,000 for a uh, representative review of Sakai and would add on at about 19,000 each, a review of that on iOS and a review of that on Android. Everyone I've talked to about this previously has kind of agreed that we don't necessarily need the specific mobile testing, but that was not, nonetheless what the response was and I, that decision is not yet made, and it's one to consider. We only have these two scope of works, but WebAIM almost represents the exact other end of that spectrum. They suggested they do another representative review for $12,000. And they, of course, are doing OAEs, uh, and um, that I understand to be going well. A little more of what a review means. So a review, and thank you, Marilyn, for that. A review produces a, a report um, that's turned over to the uh, groups that uh, commissioned it. And in my experience, when Brock University commissioned one and others I've seen, uh, you get a report, a document with identified issues, typically ways to address the issue. And uh, good reports will have uh, screenshots, uh, standards that are a concern. Part of that process typically requires the person commissioning that work to provide a system to test, provide some use cases. Um, in the case of Sakai, provide content. So that's the kind of review. Um, audit can, can have more meaning than one would want. That's why I'm using the term review. But audits, review, um, apologies for using the two interchangeably. But that's, that's what we have so far as far as our uh, dollars we can associate with this. Uh, and I'm seeing some nice uh, words about WebAIM. And I like Adam's concern about accessibility review to be built into the code review, uh, which is great. One. Uh, and I would agree with Adam, but uh, the challenge we've had the last little while is who would do that? Um, and my aspirational goal is that uh, every developer should be concerned about accessibility, and um, that is more and more the case every day. But nonetheless, it's uh, it's not a simple task. I, um, in my experience, it's getting simpler, and uh, my other experience I've observed in Sakai development is uh, things like uh, small widgets that do things like tabbed layout or accordion displays. There's an emerging practice of having people justify why they need to invent their own versus adopt one that are known and uh, further would have good accessibility reputations. jQuery UI being and the Fluid project being two sources of web widgets that have a good accessibility reputation. Uh, Marilyn's concerned about the real life experience of persons who is blind, a very good point. That functional review is uh, one of the benefits of commissioning this work. Uh, you get real life, uh, you either get someone with who is a person living with disability or day-to-day uh, -day living with alternative interface to the web, or you get someone who's got a lot of experience there. It, automated tools, 
our starting point for accessibility review. Um, and people like myself and others, developers, instructional designers, can watch for things, but the uh, most valuable review is an uh, individual who has that data experience, and that's ideally what we would be commissioning. Adam threw in there, how about a uh, accessibility checklist for developers? Um, there's a much too long list of resources on the Confluence uh, site for the accessibility working group, and uh, I have on my to-do list to um, kind of curate down some go-to stuff. And the other challenge with a checklist is um, uh, WCAG is a checklist, so the, it, it's more that in specific situations, what subset do you need? And I hear that feedback, and I want to try and do something to make that better for developers. Okay, and then the other important thing is uh, a review or audit, which we, which I'm using almost interchangeably, um, is that that's only the identification. We still would need to actually do the work. And that work could be trivial. Um, an example of that is work on lessons so far. Um, the work on lessons so far has been uh, from the earlier partial reviews. Those the changes identified were things like adding um, aria roles, uh, single properties on tags, and the way that lessons is built. It was uh, apparently quite simple to make the modification once it's identified. Contrast that to if we have issues identified with a legacy framework or a tool that has other issues like RWiki and Sakai, those could be really substantive work. So as far as projecting costs for that, it's really difficult to project those costs before we know uh, what needs to be worked on. And beyond that, the um, individual item that needs to be remediated could be very complex or very simple. Uh, the plan, uh, as I conceived of it so far, is if we can agree on some priorities and some guiding principles, then faced with uh, these kinds of decisions, as a community, we'd know what we would prefer, what, where to go. Uh, so that's one way to plan for the unknown, but it's obviously challenging. So after that, I was hoping to pause again for some updates. And I see there's a lot of good stuff scrolling through in the chat room. Uh, Bill, I appreciate your, uh, I, I, I bet, experience with WebAIM SSB's uh, reports. That was my suspicion, and I'm good to see it validated. Uh, Louisa, I'm glad to hear there's work happening lessons. They've been really receptive to the feedback they've gotten. Terry, yep. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, Terry's got a question about screen reading. I find the best uh, screen reading tool out there that's uh, free is Chromevox, built in the Chrome. But MVDA, it builds recommended is a free um, tool for Windows that has built, well, it's, it's Australian uh, of origin, and uh, it's a free screen reader for Windows, which is nice to have. Chromevox is built in to, as a Chrome extension. Um, as everyone knows, that uh, most people know, pardon me, that JAWS is kind of the definitive uh, screen reading tool, but it is quite expensive. And uh, it's, it's uh, Louise is asking about checking accessibility right now. I use the WAVE uh, uh, checker a lot myself. Um, the Chrome has another built into, I still prefer WAVEs. Uh, there's a list up on the uh, Confluence page in the accessibility working group, which I may jump over to and copy in, but if someone can to find that and copy it in the chat, that'd be great. But um, the challenge with the quick tools is there are excellent ways to find spots to investigate, but when 
it comes to things like uh, determining meaning, then um, that's difficult to do automated testing with. And the other thing is that the lived experience of individuals that use these alternative interfaces counts for a lot. Um, the process that OAE is going through right now uh, has illustrated that if uh, you find yourself on OAE's uh, website and their blog, and I think I can do this one pretty quickly, they are working through WebAIM right now, and they have a really simple example of the kind of accessibility concern that um, some may not notice, or what a developer may not intuitively notice. And I'm just grabbing the URL now. Oh well. It's the second uh, blog post over at uh, OAE's um, blog. WebAIM worked with them and identified that in one of their um, forum discussion chat dialogues, they have a picture of the individual, an avatar of the individual, their name, uh, a relevant time of when they posted, and then the message they posted. The, um, the Feedback they got from WebAIM was the experience of an individual viewing that page with a screen reader was the screen reader read off, reads off the alt text for the image, which they had chosen to be the person's name. And then the very next thing that the screen reader encounters is the person's name. So uh, the screen reader sounds something like Matt Clare or image, Matt Clare, title, Matt Clare, about five minutes ago. I did blah, 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 here's my posting. So the, what they're moving towards is I believe leaving that alt tag blank, knowing that the screen reader is immediately afterwards going to encounter that person's name. So that, those are a simple example that I really appreciated of how um, a screen, having someone who uses a screen reader, a functional test of a web page can give insights that Otherwise, a simple standard or um, someone immersed in development might not observe. Um, talk about JAWS. Uh, thank you for clarifying the screen reader. There is a JavaScript framework for um, accessibility testing that I've got in my notes and maybe I'll circle back around to. Um, but there is a JavaScript-based one. That would be quite the boon for Sakai to ship with and immediately check uh, accessibility uh, content is created. But I think that's a separate issue. Uh, my The concern and focus of the rally plan is ensuring that um, the Sakai uh, portal of itself out of the box comes, at, comes to end users, teacher, teachers and learners and others in a manner that we know is accessible both so that it is accessible and that uh, we, we can uh, make that promise. All right, pausing for any other questions or concerns. Oh, and jumping around on my computer as well. So we've had um, some organizations uh, express that they would like to make a financial contribution to this that are really preliminary. Oh, thank you for that uh, JavaScript uh, inspector link. Thank you. Um, early preliminary scope of works that I mentioned earlier have a huge range of costs, plus that's before development. Um, Organizations like Tufts and possibly Oxford and certainly Aperio have made financial contributions. If you are a part or representing an organization that uh, is interested in making a financial contribution, I would love to hear from you at any point, um, publicly, confidentially, because uh, we need to start uh, figuring out what is possible, what is needed, what the target remains to be, and what our successes are. And uh, I'm, I'm always hesitant to announce uh, other people's money, but I do uh, appreciate those that have indicated their contribution so far. And uh, I see Adam's uh, uh, 
identifying Oxford as a contributor, which is great. Um, and uh, Longsight and Perio have also um, offered to contribute. Uh, Perio in all the things Perio contributes to the Sakai project, as well as some dollars. Um, others have uh, been interested in contributing um, uh, Longsight in, in, as well. Uh, dollars for the review and or uh, work for responding to what's identified because that's a critical part and um, dollars for review make a big difference but um, the, if you can contribute in-kind work that's important if you can contribute in-kind work in an area of expertise for your institution um, uh, as a really simple example Rutgers has for lessons, uh, that's really valuable too because uh, everyone who's been involved in Sakai development knows the, um, the challenges that can be uncovered when someone tries to pick up a, a component of Sakai that they're unfamiliar with versus the um, advantage one has when they're already familiar. Thanks, Karen, mentioning that uh, the Durham Tech received funds for donations that they can con contribute. Uh, Karen and I have talked uh, through email, and congratulations, Durham Tech, for receiving a grant for their excellent work um, in, I believe, employing uh, individuals that are blind. And that uh, donation, I believe, was in recognition of that great work. Hey, Matt, this is Neil. Um, Adam had a question twice about what happened to the Sakai 2.8 accessibility statement that was at the footer of every page? Personally, I, d I don't know. I don't know if you know either. Uh, I don't know either. Um, and that's one of those areas of Sakai that gets uh, locally modified a lot. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, so it's tough to track. And it was part of the old help. Uh, I do know that the old help uh, had reference to contacting um, Brian Richwine at Indiana. <laughs> he was a great resource for Sakai, but the poor guy just emailed me about a month ago um, asking why a certain institution students were still emailing him about uh, accessibility. That's uh, because they have old documentation. So uh, why is it not there? There's still a help document about accessibility that is just a, um, a revision of the older one and updated. Uh, it just mentions reaching out to Sakai uh, for inquiries. It doesn't have a direct email anymore. And uh, my understanding of that statement was uh, it's more information referential, talks about the access keys, talks about um, ways to interact with Sakai through alternative interfaces. It's not, as I recall it, not a statement about the specific um, standards met by Sakai, more about the here's ways to interact with Sakai through alternative means. And as far as it being on the footer, uh, I, I think that's part of the documentation shift, uh, the help shift, I should say, to be more specific. Okay, well, um, as we were on my blank slide, I need to quickly uh, uh, confirm uh, what we had next. Uh, yes. So areas of Sakai need to be prioritized. Um, we do have a sense of, in Sakai 10, um, what is a known, what's an unknown, um, and I'm resisting quoting someone famous about unknowns. And um, we do have a current list that uh, myself and some of the others in the Accessibility Working Group have cobbled together of numbers of pages and uh, what is uh, something that those partial audits are, have identified for us. What do we have some confidence based on Sakai legacy are unchanged and still to a high standard, but we also 
have a, uh, items identified that this is totally new, this is unreviewed. And so we have a, a general sense of that. A comprehensive review is the best plan, but we do have ways to um, uh, limit our scope if we need to, not that that's our goal. And if you're interested in um, that uh, screenshot document, it's linked there, which I don't think works for you in this current format. Um, but we have roughly, if you're ever interested, 438 unique pages in Sakai, 10, and about 341 unreviewed. A crude measure, but I'm sharing as information you may be uh, concerned about. <laughs> lessons tool rank number one. Uh, lessons tool rank number one because that is not, uh, that's a rank based on areas unknown and importance. And lessons is obviously very important to everyone using Sakai. Um, but yeah, if you, uh, uh, and it, also lessons hasn't had a formal audit that I'm aware of, but if that is not the case, then, um, then uh, I would love to hear about that formal audit. Uh, I haven't got a chance to address the rally plan tag in, and Jira, yes, sir, uh, but Neil did mention it's a component, accessibility is a component in Jira, and you can uh, go through those items. Um, and, uh, excuse me, uh, I can share the quick search list on that, but I do want to uh, emphasize that one of the issues we have as a community, as a Sky project is, it's not just the number of JIRAs that are un, unresolved around accessibility, it's the amount of JIRAs yet to be created around accessibility. The fact that uh, our, we don't even have a, 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 a meaningful sense of all the work that needs to be found. So uh, in summary, um, this is a great community that we have somehow managed to cobble together from around the world of awesome people that are motivated to make the best uh, learning management system that could ever be made. And I think that counts for a lot. And I think that we can use that to great advantage in addressing this issue. Um, I think that, um, that the, uh, challenge before us is not one that we can't meet. And I think that um, even though today Sakai can't formally suggest that it meets a, a standard of accessibility, um, one thing it can say that it's a community that is very concerned about it and takes it very seriously and values it a lot. And uh, next step is just to, to uh, identify that or prove that, um, if I can say that word, uh, from here on out. So I'll, Turn it over to any uh, follow-up some of questions, but that's the presentation I had here. If you'd like to uh, hang around and chat about accessibility in Sakai, I can hang around. If you want to talk um, uh, offline or through other means, I could have left my email address on the slide but didn't, um, but that's a good place to reach me. It's uh, matt.claire, C-L-A-R-E, at baraki.ca, uh, which is dropped in the chat room. Track me down on uh, Twitter or join our Accessibility Working Group uh, conference call every other Thursday, not tomorrow, but a week tomorrow at, at 2 o'clock Eastern and watch the Sakai Dev mailing list for that. Thank you, everyone, for your participation. I hope to uh, both hear from you and to have great news to share about this soon. Thanks for the nice words, everyone, and uh, it's great to see you all.